This lecture will go over management of hyperthyroidism. In North America, the most common interventions are drug therapy and radioablation. Surgery is reserved for severe disease that is not responsive to other forms of management. Medical management is used to decrease the effect of thyroid hormone on cardiac function and to reduce thyroid hormone secretion. The priorities for nursing care focus on monitoring for complications, reducing stimulation, promoting comfort, and teaching the patient and family about their therapeutic drugs and procedures. In regards to non-surgical management, monitoring includes measuring the patient's apical pulse, blood pressure, and temperature at least every four hours. Instruct the patient to report immediately any palpitations, dyspnea, vertigo, or chest pain. Increases in temperature may indicate a rapid worsening of the patient's condition and the onset of a thyroid storm, a life-threatening event that occurs with uncontrolled hyperthyroidism and is characterized by high fever and severe hypertension. Immediately report a temperature increase of even one degree Fahrenheit. If temperature is elevated, immediately assess the patient's cardiac status. If the patient has a cardiac monitor, check for dysrhythmias. Reducing stimulation helps prevent increasing the symptoms of hyperthyroidism and the risk for cardiac complications. Encourage the patient to rest. Keep the environment quiet by closing the door and limiting visitors. Um, and also eliminate or postpone any non-essential care or treatments. Promoting comfort includes reducing the room temperature to decrease discomfort caused by heat intolerance. Instruct the UAP to ensure that the patient always has a fresh pitcher of ice water and to change the bed linen whenever it becomes damp from diaphoresis. Suggest that the patient take a cool shower or sponge bath several times a day. For the patient with exophthalmos, prevent eye dryness by encouraging the use of artificial tears. Drug therapy with antithyroid drugs is, is the initial treatment for hyperthyroidism and causes some patient to go into remission for as long as 10 years. Chart 63-3 lists teaching priorities for the patient receiving drug therapy for hyperthyroidism, and I'd like for you to review that on your own. The preferred drugs are thionamides, especially methimazole. Um, Propothiouracil is also used. Uh, it's frequently called PTU. It's used less often uh, because of its toxic effects on the liver. So PTU, I help remember at least for myself, is put thyroid under. So I remember it as a drug that's turning the thyroid down. Um, but again, methimazole is one that you'd want to recognize as a, as a popular drug you just use to treat hyperthyroidism. These drugs block thyroid hormone production by preventing iodide binding in the thyroid gland. Iodine preparations may be used for short-term therapy before surgery. They decrease blood flow to the thyroid gland, reducing the production and release of thyroid hormone. This treatment can result in hypothyroidism and the patient is monitored closely. Beta blocking drugs such as propanolol may be used as supportive therapy. These drugs relieve diaphoresis, anxiety, tachycardia, and palpitation, but have nothing to do with thyroid hormone production. Radioactive iodine therapy is not used in pregnant women because it crosses the placenta and can damage fetal thyroid gland. The thyroid gland picks up the radioactive iodine and some of the cells that produce thyroid hormone are destroyed by local radiation. Because the thyroid gland stores thyroid hormones to some degree, the patient may not have complete symptom relief for up to eight to six weeks after radioactive iodine therapy. Additional drug therapy for hyperthyroidism is still needed during the first few weeks after radioactive iodine therapy. Radioactive iodine therapy, also known as RAI therapy, is performed on an outpatient basis. One dose may not be sufficient, they may need a second or third. The radiation dose is low and is usually completely eliminated within a month. However, the source is unsealed and some radioactivity is present in the patient's body fluids and stool for a few weeks after therapy. Radiation precautions are necessary to prevent exposure to family members and other people. Chart 63-4 lists the precautions to teach to patients during the first few re weeks after receiving radioactive iodine. Please review chart 63-4 on your own. It has important information about patient teaching regarding radiation, um, and we're, but we're not going to take the time to review it in this lecture. 
The degree of thyroid destruction varies. Some patients become hypothyroid as a result of treatment. The patient then needs a lifelong thyroid hormone replacement. In terms of surgical management for hyperthyroidism, surgery to remove all or part of the thyroid gland is used for Graves' disease that does not respond to other therapies. It, can, it is also used when a large goiter causes tracheal or esophageal compression. After a to total thyroidectomy, patients must take lifelong thyroid hormone replacement. In terms of pre-op care, the patient is treated with thionamide drug therapy first to have near normal thyroid function before thyroid surgery. Iodine preparations are used to decrease thyroid size and vascularity, thereby reducing the risk for hemorrhage and the potential for a thyroid storm during surgery. And we'll talk more about thyroid storms in a minute. Hypertension, dysrhythmias, and tachycardia must be controlled before surgery. So the goal here pre-op is to get things controlled, get, to get the thyroid level controlled, to get um, cardiac issues controlled. The patient with hyperthyroidism may need to follow a high protein, high carb diet for days or weeks before surgery. Teach the patient um, just regular surgical things here, deep breathing exercises. Um, we wanna teach them that they're gonna need to support the neck when coughing or moving by placing both hands behind the neck to reduce strain on the incision. We wanna tell them that they may be hoarse for a few days because of the endotracheal tube. In terms of the operative procedure, with these sur surgeries, as with traditional open approach, the parathyroid glands are, re are recurrent and recurrent laryngeal nerves are avoided to reduce the risk for complications and injury. So whether it's a minimally invasive surgery or an open surgery, the surgeon is gonna to try to protect the parathyroid glands. Remember, those are located on the back side of the thyroid glands and also the laryngeal nerves. With a total thyroidectomy, the entire thyroid gland is removed, but the parathyroid glands are left with an intact blood supply to prevent causing hypoparathyroidism. In terms of post-op care, monitoring the patient for complications is the most important nursing action after thyroid surgery. Monitor vital signs every 15 minutes until the patient is stable and then every 30 minutes. Assess the patient's level of discomfort. Use pillows to support the neck and head. Place the patient when, while he or she is awake in a semi-faller's position. Avoid positions that cause neck extension. Give prescribed medications for pain control. Help the patient deep breathe every 30 minutes to one hour, suction oral and tracheal secretions as needed. Thyroid surgery can cause hemorrhage, respiratory distress with gas exchange, parathyroid gland injury resulting in hypocalcemia and tetany, damage to the laryngeal nerves and thyroid st storm. Remain alert to the potential for complications and help identify symptoms early. In terms of hemorrhage, Hemorrhage is most likely to occur during the first 24 hours after surgery. Inspect the neck dressing and behind the patient's neck for blood. A drain may be present and a moderate amount of serosanguineous drainage is normal. Hemorrhage may be seen as bleeding at the incision site or a respiratory distress caused by tracheal compression. Respiratory distress and reduced gas exchange can result from swelling, tetany, or damage to the laryngeal nerve resulting in spasms. Laryngeal strider is heard in acute respiratory obstruction. Keep emerg emergency tracheostomy equipment in the patient's room and check that oxygen and suctioning equipment are nearby and working. Monitor the patient to identify signs of obstruction or poor gas exchange, such as strider, dyspnea, decreasing O2 saturation, inability to swallow, and drooling after thyroid surgery. If any indications of, of obstruction are present, respond by immediately notifying the rapid response team. Hypocalcemia and tetany may occur if the parathyroid glands are removed or damaged or their blood supply is impaired during thyroid surgery, resulting in decreased parathyroid hormone levels. Ask the patient hourly about tingling around the mouth or of the toes or fingers. Assess for muscle twitching as a sign of calcium deficiency. Calcium gluconate or calcium chloride for IV use should be available in an emergency situation. Laryngeal nerve damage may occur during surgery. This problem results in hoarseness and a weak voice. Assess the patient's voice at two hour intervals and document any changes. Reassure the patient that hoarseness is usually temporary. 
thyroid storm or thyroid crisis. This is a life-threatening event that occurs in patients with uncontrolled hyperthyroidism, most often with Graves' disease. Symptoms develop quickly, and the problem is fatal if left untreated. It is often triggered by stressors, such as trauma, infection, diabetic ketoacidosis, and pregnancy. Other conditions that can lead to a thyroid storm include vigorous palpitation of the goiter, exposure to iodine, and radioactive iodine therapy. Although thyroid storm after surgery is less common because of drug therapy before thyroid surgery, it can still occur. Symptoms of thyroid storm are caused by excessive thyroid hormone release, which dramatically increase metabolic rate. Key symptoms include fever, tachycardia, and systolic hypertension. The patient may also have abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. He or she is very anxious and has tremors. As the crisis progresses, the patient may become restless, confused, or psychotic, and may have seizures leading to coma. Even with treatment, thyroid storm may lead to death. When caring with a patient with hyperthyroidism, even after a thyroidectomy, assess temperature often because an increase of even one degree Fahrenheit may indicate an impending thyroid crisis. If an increase occurs, respond by reporting it immediately to the primary health care provider. Emergency measures to prevent death vary with the intensity and type of changes. Interventions focus on maintaining airway patency, promoting adequate ventilation and gas exchange, reducing fever, I'm sorry, reducing fever, and stabilizing the hemodynamic status. Please review chart 63-5, emergency care of the patient during a thyroid storm on your own. That has important information about caring for a patient who's experiencing a thyroid storm. I envision problems of Graves' disease are not corrected by treatment for hyperthyroidism and management is symptomatic. Teach the patient with mild problems to elevate the head of the bed at night and use artificial tears. If photophobia is problematic, uh, we want to advise them to use dark glasses. For those who, not, who cannot close their eyelids completely, we can recommend gently taping the lids closed at bedtime. If pressure behind the eye continues and forces the eye forward, blood supply to the eye can become compromised, leading to ischemia and blindness. In severe cases, short-term glucocorticoid therapy is prescribed to reduce swelling and halt the in infiltrative process. Other management strategies include external radiation combined with low-dose glucocorticoid therapy. Surgical interventions, orbital decompression, may be needed if loss of sight or damage to the eyeball is possible. Health teaching includes reviewing with the patient and family the symptoms of hyperthyroidism and instructing the patient to report an increase or recurrence of any of these. Also teach about the symptoms of hypothyroidism and the need for hormone replacement therapy. Reinforce the need for a regular follow-up because hypothyroidism can occur several years after radioactive iodine therapy.